And welcome into the rant, everybody. Not a good pass from Kirk Cousins to end the half. Chicago up 14-0 on Minnesota. Caden uh, McFarland, Bill Haston here for the rant. The Oklahoma Sooners are one win away. They control their Big 12 title destiny. They do. Two wins away from winning the Big 12 for a fourth straight time. Nobody has ever done that. They go to West Virginia this Friday, short week. It should be what we're talking about. All we can talk about, though, is that sorry defense. Are you kidding me? All right, it, let, me, let me just, just to, to make the case that it's never been worse in Norman with regard to an Oklahoma defense. Certainly not with an – I mean, points per game, they're 83rd in the country. Yards, they're 84th. Yards per play, 69th. Pass efficiency, 86th. Pass yards, 108th. Turnovers, 129th out of 130 teams. It defies explanation that they have as many four-star recruits on that defense as they do, and yet they give up 40 points and come up with two tackles for loss against the Kansas Jayhawks. For the first time in eight years, the Jayhawks score 40 on a Big 12 opponent. So we got to talk about this, Bill. Yeah. I mean, last week or the last couple weeks, we've said, look, this team isn't going to win the championship. They got no – forget Kyler Murray could bedevil Nick Saban. They're not beating Alabama or Clemson. Now I'm saying they don't even deserve to be in the top four. This well, defense has played at a level I can't possibly put them in the top four, whether it's Michigan, Georgia, Notre Dame, whatever. Even if somebody takes a loss next week, this team can't be in the playoff one of with the, that defense. Here's one of the great questions, here, the great unknowns going into Friday is – where is West Virginia now psychologically? Well, that's a good point. That game looks we'll, a lot we'll different. We'll talk about that big old upset for OSU over West Virginia. Okay, we so were you, both there yesterday. You say, Caden, and you're correct, that OSU has a bunch of highly recruited, heavily recruited guys uh, on, on the defensive side of the program, and they do, uh, but, and there's no explanation for what's going on. The only explanation that I can come up with is that, um, you know, on every team, there's a guy or two. Look at these missed tackles. There's a guy or two. I know. There's, oh my you know, in the numbers, the, the Kansas offensive, uh, especially in the run game yesterday, are mind-boggling. Ten yards per carry. Well, for the Puka game. Williams averaged 16.8. <laughs> why, why didn't they give it to him 40 times? I don't know. They gave it to him 15, and he got 252. Uh, but as my, you were saying, the only explanation I can come up with is that on every team uh, or every position group or every – defense or offense, well, there's a guy or two who just doesn't develop and, or just doesn't pan out at the level you expect, right? Okay. There, you always see that. The, the, you know, a guy just doesn't quite develop into what, what you expected him to be out of high school. I just think OU has a tragically high number of those of guys right now. I well, do. okay, so I said there's defying explanation. I, I would say – we don't have answers for everything, but we can certainly tell you what's going on. And part of what's going on, number one, let's start with the fact that there are no NFL guys here. There are no real difference makers. Whether they're recruited as four stars, five stars, three stars, two stars, whatever they are, there's nobody that you look at like a Gerald McCoy and say, oh, that dude, yeah, I get why he's at Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. There's nobody like that. So you start with that. No difference makers. Two, even though guys may have speed, or may have some elite athleticism. They're four-star looking guys. The way it's been pieced together, and this is on Mike Stoops, who's, who's now fired, the way it's been pieced together simply wasn't good. I, I don't know what his plan was. He's changed the scheme too much as far as three down, four down. You don't look at them and say, okay, here's what they're going for. I right. see it. Here's why they recruit this kind of kid. He fits in this way. There is no fit. They're all just thrown together. Sometimes a guy plays good, but usually the guys around him don't. And, you know, and then we just switch. Everybody trades the next right. week. So you don't have top-level guys. You don't have NFL guys. But then you also haven't really recruited pieces that are complementary. No. And now there's been this incredible loss of confidence. There are some guys who can play better. They're capable of more. But confidence is so low. And don't buy into some of this trash talk, some of the fake swag. We see it every week now from this defense. These guys have no confidence in what they're doing. I don't think they have very much in the coaches, putting them in a good spot. I can't listen to Ruffin McNeil say Fido one more time or any of his players to forget it and drive on. Right. I, I can't take it. At least Mike Stoops would step up and say, put it on me. I mean, I loved that about Mike Stoops. He was accountable. Now we're getting a lot of excuses in Lincoln Riley last week, Hemming and Hawing. He was a little bit better last night after the ball game and saying that this is unacceptable. 
But anyway, all that said, here's, here's something I texted you earlier. One thing I do not understand, iron sharpens iron, right? If you go good on good, you should get better. They get to see every day in practice the best offense in the whole stinking country. Certainly and the one best of the most certainly the physical the best offensive, offensive lines yeah. in the entire country. How yeah. are they not any tougher than this? I, I don't it know. makes no sense. Well, they, that would just suggest to me they don't go good on good very often. Yeah, maybe you're uh, right. And they and when they do, it's very limited thud stuff with a quick whistle. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it just it's you know who just, doesn't do that. Alabama doesn't do that. They go good on good. No, that's tough right. man, tough guy football all the time. Why wouldn't you be doing what Alabama's doing? They won five titles in the last 10 years. The most physical exercise in, in the game is is called the Oklahoma that's drill. That's right. And, 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 and so, you you know, that's a real uh, manhood tester, a real, you know, it's the essence of football. That's right. The Oklahoma drill. And it was drill. the essence of Oklahoma football for so long. Right. And, and so this, now... Uh, I, I'm just telling you, Caden, I just think that they have a really – you're exactly right. The, defensively, the program has no identity. That's right. Right now. And then you have a bunch of guys who just aren't as good. Now, do, do I think the coaches are, are, are just uh, clueless fools? No, I don't. And I think they try to teach technique, and I think that um, – I think there's a bunch of guys who don't retain well. I think there's a bunch yeah, of guys who don't tackle where the crap. I think there's a bunch of guys who may not retain yep. very well. You yeah, see that? I don't they know. They don't, they're not a smart defense, right? I mean, they don't have an understanding of what is needed when situational football. I mean, you don't see from these guys what you see from, you know, Alabama, Clemson, Michigan, those defenses that are all the best in the country. And by the way, those are the teams that are going to be in the playoff. I'll throw Notre Dame and Georgia in there as well. You look at all the defensive statistics. Those guys are not just top 20 in everything. Mostly, they're top 10 in everything. OU isn't close in a single category. Right. How can you make a playoff case for these guys, even if, say, Notre Dame takes a loss at USC next week? How can you make a playoff case for the Sooners with the defense that bad? The Kansas Jayhawks with a, uh, a lame duck coach. Uh, yeah. At Norman, had 524 total yards, ran for 348, averaged, before Saturday, averaged, the Jayhawks did, 142 rush yards a game, and they get 348 against the Sooners. Puka Williams, 252 on the ground, 16.8 per attempt. Same kid, before Saturday, 86 yards a game, 5.9 right. per attempt. It, I, it's just. I it's, don't know if this is rock bottom. We all thought Texas was rock bottom, and it's managed to get worse but it is a new low 40 points surrendered against kansas at home is worse than 46 to lubbock with only one half of bowman it's worse than 47 in bedlam it's worse than the 59 or whatever it was they gave up to patrick mahomes a couple years ago it's worse than the 49 they gave up to tamon austin or whatever that score was back in 20 right. it's there's been a whole bunch of bad defense played in norman for the last half decade right last night was the worst we've seen well but I'm sure there are people who I'm sure there are fans, invested fans who turn the television on every week, yeah, and wait to and, and are waiting for it to get better. But it's not going no, to get. It's not going to get better. Not, not this, this year. year. No. Um, so that makes so. I mean, there. It's tra it's tragic too that they play this kind of defense at a time when they've yeah. had, arguably the four. If you lump the four years together, yep. maybe the four best years of quarterback play in the history of the in program. The, is is it years. the best in the history of college football? Well, I don't Who's know. had four years better than what Baker Mayfield did and now well, Kyler that, Murray? That's, great. that's a great question. Kyler Murray's the best player in college football. We heard Tim Brando saying it last night. Mm -hmm. Anybody with eyes will admit that at this point. Maybe Tua Tagovailoa is going to be your Heisman winner because Alabama has had an incredible season. He's unlocked some things for that offense. They're averaging 50 a game, too. Give him credit. But he's not better than Kyler Murray. Well, I mean, and I don't know if we got that in the highlights or if we just showed the, the defensive garbage. But what Kyler Murray did last night, well, I mean, that was a freak show. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Two of his touchdown runs are plays that nobody else in the country is capable of making. He is right. a joy to watch, and that's what makes his defense that much worse. Right. If you had this going on for a team that was 9-3 and three and we all knew a rebuild was coming, that'd be one thing. But this is national championship-worthy offense being squandered and spoiled by the worst defense anybody you, uh, can remember you, playing for OU. I don't have – I didn't research it, don't have the numbers here, but, but I, I think you're you – know, when I really think about it, you've got to be right. The, the, 
this is the four, and if you go 15 through 18, uh, quarterback play at Oklahoma, it probably is, statistically, it's the best in the history of college football. Yeah. I can't imagine who would be better because it is out of this world. That's right. Um, well, because, I mean, we're talking about unprecedented efficiency numbers, uh, yards per completion, yards per attempt, yardage, uh, period, touchdowns versus picks, all of every measurable uh, to, to gauge the, the value of a passing game, and, and OU knocks it out of the park. That said, they get to go play for a spot in the Big 12 championship game, and if they beat West Virginia, they are almost certainly playing Texas in the Big 12 title game in Arlington. And how much fun, you know, would that be? So there's a lot out in front of these guys. Lincoln Riley continues to remind us of that. Uh, they don't need to be good on defense. They just need to be a little bit better than, uh, you know, the worst that we've ever seen in Norman. Well, this is a legacy game for Kyler Murray. I mean, yeah. Friday night. It, it's, it's, uh, I've been to, I don't know, five, four or five games at, at, uh, at West Virginia. All night. I've never covered a day game at West Virginia, I don't yeah. believe. I think they've all been night games. So uh, it, it's a it's a tough assignment, but yes. I don't know that it's as tough as it was uh, before West Virginia got their bubble burst uh, at Stillwater yesterday. Let's talk about that. The uh, the Mountaineers had a 31-14 lead at the half. Kick a walk-off field goal at the end of the half, go up 31-14, and I wouldn't have given you a nickel Absolutely. for OSU's chances. This guy point. right here, I, and this is, for me, this is the centerpiece of it. Senior day for Taylor Cornelius starts this way. He gets the big ovation. And then he ends up accounting for six touchdowns and leading that game-winning drive in the final minute. The you got Gary Busey in the house. <laughs> that bodes well, right? Uh, I I have so much respect for the way these guys battled back. You know, against Texas, they were the team that they had the week off and they came out with the incredible game plan. That's one thing. This is a top 10 team mm -hmm. where you go down by 17 mm -hmm. and you scratch and claw back when you're just five and five. It, when it, look, I kind of mocked it a few weeks ago when when they were getting the yellow flags thrown every other play against Baylor, that right. cowboy culture thing. Right. Mike Gundy loves to talk about it. I'll take my hat. I mean, that was a cowboy culture win yesterday. No, it was. Um, they're down 17 at the half. Cornelius has been picked twice. Yeah, that's right. After having yep. been incomplete at the goal line in Bedlam at the end of the game. Yep. So I mean, he's got he's had a rough week. You know, and Gundy said it himself in the post game. That he, he said, you, even though Cornelius doesn't talk about it, you know it crushed him right. that, that we didn't win that game in Bedlam. So he had a hard week, and then he comes back, he throws two picks, uh, and they're down 17 at the half. And it looked like, uh, you know, I mean, and, and when West Virginia was, as we see here on the monitor, yeah, well, ahead, I mean, they made it look easy in the first quarter and a half. And I thought, I thought OSU was just going to get beat. I, 49 to 27, something in that range. And, and, it, and I just thought, man, what, you know, you, you've, ha you've had some big home losses. You've laid those two giant eggs on the road at Manhattan and Waco. And man, what a terrible way to close the season. Sure. You're not even gonna go to a bowl. Uh -huh. you, how are you gonna muster the motivation to go win at TCU uh, yeah. in a must win to go to a bowl situation? But then, and the stadium was half empty. Oh no! Isn't that part of this too? I mean, mm -hmm. so many people stayed away after halftime, and they came back with this kind of fight. Gundy gave his coaching staff credit for the halftime adjustments. They gave him credit, though. They gave that's right. Yursic gave the credit right back to Gundy, at yeah. least for the offensive adjustment. But I, I look, I loved what they did defensively in the second half because to me, you can spin that forward. Like this is first year of Jim Knowles. Early on, we were lauding what was going on. There was more pressure and all that. And, I mean, he got schooled in that Big 12 opener against Texas Tech. And they've given up more points than anybody else in this league in Big 12 play, about 38 per game. Right. But he figured some – first of all, I think that they played a good second half in Bedlam against the best offense in the country. And then in the second half against West Virginia, one of the best offenses in the country. Mm -hmm. Those – I mean, they held them to 10 points, one touchdown. Three of those points were on a special team's Mind you know, mistake. I, they played great football in the second half. And then, you know, I mean, ultimately, <laughs> it, it, as it so often happens in the Big 12, Caden, I mean, it was uh, uh, Will Greer throwing it into – throwing the football into the end zone, do or die. Yep. Last play. Somehow, I mean, it's just, with one second left, they got it down to the 14-yard line. Mm -hmm. And A.J. Green got away with a little bit of uh, contact. And here is that final play. 
But to me, the Big 12, I've said this for years, if you want to help your defenses a little bit, and the, this league needs to more than any other, they've got to allow a little bit more of that from the corners. And I thought A.J. Green, one, I thought he played a great game. He was physical at times, maybe got away with a couple things, but he, he played a really fine game. And he's the kind of guy, the Sooners don't have an A.J. Green. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know what I mean? You got right. this guy for two more years, and he looks like a guy who can do some things for you on the corner. If you're going to do anything in this league defensively, you need the kind of performance they got right. from number four yesterday. And A.J. Green is a guy who got his heart broken on that last play at Baylor. Yeah, that's right. Remember? And so he's had, a, he's had a – Oh, sure. He's been know, up and down. It, it's, it's so funny because Mark Cooper and I were talking during the game. And, How great is this, by the way? Yeah, it was, it, was, it was great stuff after the game. Uh, Mark Cooper and I were talking yesterday about uh, certain Cowboys who haven't performed at the level you would expect this season. Okay. And A.J. Green definitely is on that level. But yet, uh, you know – A.J. Green, and then in the second half, I actually remember telling Mark, A.J. Green's playing a heck of a game today. And then he makes the knockdown, he knocks the football down uh, to win the game at yeah. the end. So, but, but for Cornelius uh, to follow the Bedlam heartbreak, to follow a two interception first half, and then to n not only, uh, you know, the, the, what they did offensively, Gundy said, was just to scrap everything they had planned all week and to go four wides, spread the field, Tempo it up a little more, yep. and then and then Chuba Hubbard played great. Tylen Wallace again in a big game was great, yep. and Cornelius uh, very effective in the run game. Uh, you know the guy counts for six touchdowns and over 400 yards offense. He was excellent. He, a former walk-on from way out there in West Texas, mm -hmm. tiny little town, Bushland, right? Yeah. Carves out a legacy. I mean, people are going to remember number 14. He's not Brandon Whedon. He's obviously not Mason Rudolph, he's not Zach Robinson, but he got his one year after being a program guy who hung in there, mm -hmm. and he delivered two wins over top 10 teams. Only Whedon can match that, mm -hmm. by the way. And one of Whedon's top 10 wins was against an A&M team that went on to go six and six. But anyway, point being, a couple a, of really, well, really game, nice though. pelts on mm -hmm. the wall, if you will, and then also the top 25 win over Boise. Yeah, this, you know, Four and five or whatever they were at 1.5. I mean, that wasn't what you were hoping for at the start of the year. But they win these final two. Eight and five with two wins over top ten teams. That sure beats going eight and five and just beating the teams you should beat. Right. And say, you know, getting your doors blown off by every top ten opponent you face. I mean, it was a memorable year. Not, not the year people wanted, obviously. But in terms of being a bridge season for Mason Rudolph, uh, to our man Sanders. Presumably Sanders. Uh, presumably. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty, pretty good. I, 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 and I look, all respect to Mike Gundy for sticking with Cornelius the way he did. I think he played the best quarterback <laughs> for this team this year. It, I, I didn't say that earlier, but Mike Gundy knows more football than me. I think right. there's a reason he stuck with Cornelius. We've seen it the last few well, weeks. Well, it's just the fickle nat nature of sports. That's us. Is, is, uh, and sports media. Is that, yep. you know, all those people who – for a lot of the season have said, you know, let's get Cornelius out of the, off the field and let's, let's see what it looks like with somebody else. A year from now, a lot of those people might be saying, man, I wish we had Don't Cornelius you wish we had back. another year at Cornelius? Yeah. And In it, fact, it, and I it am is. I almost positive that will be said. It's unfortunate, though. I mean, for <laughs> a guy to wait as long as he did and then – he's gotten better. Yeah. You know, he had that midseason lull. He wasn't he any good against Kansas State. No, he wasn't. Uh, Texas but, Tech but, wasn't but good. It's undeniable. Statistically, leadership, every way you measure quarterback effectiveness, yeah. he was at his best against Boise, OU, Texas, and West Virginia. How about that? So, so he showed up for big games, and he's got a – in my mind, it's a big game this week because seven no doubt. wins looks a lot, a lot better a lot than better. six. And, and eight and five, I mean, cheese it Bowl, Houston Bowl, wherever they end up yeah. going, eight and five, I mean, that's a season. Six and seven, eh. No. But eight and five? I mean, that's a nice little bridge season uh, to our man Sanders. If you can win eight and uh, you're in the top ten in the country in passing, yeah. uh, considering uh, some weirdness in this season, some weird circumstances, and it wasn't just him who lost at Waco, and it wasn't just him who lost at K-State. Sure. Uh, there was a lot of people uh, at fault. And we haven't even mentioned the fact that they won that game yesterday without Justice Hill. Yeah. Which, which is, uh, if you told me Hubbard's that. Hubbard's got a pretty good future, huh? Oh, Hubbard has a good present. He's <laughs> exactly real good right. today. That's exactly right. In all fact, right. so if, if Tyler Wallace already in my mind is, is at an All-American level already, uh -huh. uh, Chuba Hubbard's on the brink. He's that close. I think, yeah. I think he's really, really good. And there's a reason so many big dog programs were after him. Yeah. I see now why. Yep. Yeah.
Uh, we were both at this game yesterday, so that means that we missed yet another classic from Jenks and Union in yeah, the state did. semifinals. It comes down to the very end and is one on the last play of the game. Uh, so it's the Trojans moving on to take Broken Arrow, and I didn't see that coming in the second semifinal as they were scoreless at the half against Owasso. Bill Blankenship coaching his butt off in that game. And then BA ekes out a 10 to seven win. So it's Broken Arrow and Jenks for a state championship in two weeks. I mean, what do, what do we make of that matchup? I mean, well, Broken Arrow, uh, as we all know, they have yet to win a state championship ever in football. Right. I mean, I, you hate to see that much pressure on on kids. I love it. It's a good storyline. <laughs> it is a great storyline, no doubt. No, no, no. And, and uh, uh, no, I, I, this, I mean, B.A. had their first real, real scare of the year. That's right. I mean, they, they've oh, been that just was a, that was a real scare. people, uh -huh. just crushing people, demoralizing opponents. So, when, when Mark Cooper first told me, do you know what the halftime score of the Broken Arrow game is? And I said, like, and he said it in a way like you won't believe it. Right. I said, oh, is it? I said, 24-14. He said, scoreless. And I said, you got to be kidding. And I knew it was, <laughs> it was, uh, and I thought the same thing. Blankenship has uh -huh. really, uh, because you saw Owasso through the yep. season. I mean, the Owasso of six weeks ago, yep. no way they would have competed at that level. So they've gotten a lot better. I'll, I'll tell you, and look, Broken Arrow's gotten better this year too. I firmly believe that. But one of the marks of Jinx and Union teams for years, and now obviously Owasso's right there with them, even though they are playing competition that is nowhere close to them through most of the district year, they're beating on those West Side teams 49 nothing. Right. They get better mm -hmm. every year. We see them in September, and very often we make our opinions on who they are and what they'll be. We cement it right there in September, and that is never a good idea because these teams change, and Jinx and Union always get better. We saw that yesterday. Both of those teams were better than they had been in September. Uh, and obviously Owasso had as well. well I mean, I mean he, these teams are coached really, really well. I'll just say this about Jinx, I and mean, we got to watch football. Um, you, if you've got a kid, Caden, like Ian Corwin, who has started 38 games, yeah, something like that. Man. I mean, I mean, and, and I mean, what are the odds anyway that you're going to complete a 78-yard throw to flip the field to give yourself a chance? It's unreal. At the end, well, your odds All, are except in this rivalry, right? It happens. But but I mean. It, a quarterback with less experience, sure. uh, with less poise, with less, you know, I mean, might really freak out and just, uh, so hats off to Ian Corwin, mm -hmm. hats off to Union, uh, yep. holy cow, what a game. I mean, th this is, uh, this game belongs, it, it gets its own chapter in the history book of, of that amazing series. And then, so Broken Arrow Jinx in two weeks, I would make BA a three and a half point favorite. Right, right now, because the Jinx logo, that Jinx across the jersey, uh -huh. that's worth something. Yeah. And those Broken Arrow kids are going to look over and say, Ew. That's right. You know, we've been playing these guys since we were little. And for the most part, Jinx has won these matchups. And now, that's right. So, awesome storyline, 6A2, real quick, unbeaten Stillwater. Mm. You and I saw Gunner Gundy and unbeaten Stillwater uh, come back from 14, 14 down. to beat the Booker T uh, Washington Hornets, which. I thought when Booker T got up 14, they were going to win 42 they to 10. Obviously, Stillwater wasn't ready for the speed, but they adjusted to they the did. speed of Booker T. Washington. I mean, that's a good little ball club. That's not just Gunner Gundy. That's, I mean, that's a good team with a great little running back, some nice receivers, and obviously an offensive line that's doing its job. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a good team. So, Bixby Stillwater. Bixby Stillwater. That's good stuff. That's about a three and a half point game as well. Yeah. Uh, Please, Bix no wagering. Bixby is a favorite. No wagering, but I mean, this is just, we're just ranting. Uh, but, but no, a great, weird, I shouldn't say weird, a great weekend of football, very revealing weird, uh, uh, weekend of football. The OU defense mm -hmm. uh, kind of commands a headline because, you know, we, when, it, when it gets to that point against a Kansas and you give up those numbers and 40 points, then that kind of supersedes a lot of other stuff. I mean, because mm -hmm. even though it's been discussed for <laughs> this entire season, uh, and it started really at the Army game. Yeah. Uh, there is no chance Ruffin, McNeil, or Bob Diaco is your coordinator next year, though. No, I mean, no, these the, last three weeks have cemented. I, you have to go outside the no, family. No, no. Every, fiber, every fiber of that side of the program has got to be That's right. changed. And by the way, you see what Washington State's doing on defense? Mm -hmm. If Mike Leach can do it, 
Lincoln Riley's got to do the same. Hey, that's it for the rant. It's already what we are didn't we? even talk Six about Les Miles. Third quarter. Thumbs up, oh, thumbs yeah, down. Les Miles. I'll tell you what. Actually, yeah, because I mean, who cares? We've already gone 20 minutes. What's what's 23? Um, I like the hire, although I understand why some people are poo-pooing it. Um, you know, when I was growing up, 65 years of age as a head coach in college football, that was no big deal. Now this is some great red flag. Oh, is he going to be able to recruit? To me, Les Miles is a guy who has right. more energy than what you think of when you think of a typical 65-year-old guy. Mm. I think he's got, I don't know if Gundy learned from him or if he learned from Gundy or both, but he's got that same Gundy knack for doing some odd things that keep him in the spotlight. And you know what I mean? Like people will know what Les Miles is up to right. and they'll know Kansas football is coached by Les Miles. And I think he'll do a nice job in recruiting. I think the Louisiana ties will help. Puka, by the way, is from Louisiana. I mean, he will continue to elevate that program. That said, my understanding is they only have one recruit for the class of 2019 currently. Right. So Beatty's done a lot of work to add to the numbers, but there's still an incredible hole immediately for the class that's coming in. So, I mean, that continues to be a very, very difficult job. Do I think Les Miles is going to start re reeling off eight, nine win seasons real soon? No, but they'll, they'll be better. They'll keep getting better. Uh, when Les was at Oklahoma State, he had a tight end and a fullback and a tailback. And um, the Big 12 looks a lot different now since he left to go to the SEC. And I, so I think he's going to have to be I, – I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what he does in regard to a coordinator style yeah. of offense because he, he, he's going to be, be dragged kicking and screaming into, into what's going on in the Big 12 offensively. Yeah. Or is he going to be headstrong and stubborn and, and do, try to do what he did well, at LSU? That won't work. I've, I've th well, I've, I've thought for a long time – Not with that LSU personnel, it won't work. I've, I've thought for a long time if you, if you could do things the way Stanford does it, where you are legitimately tougher than everybody else in the league. And, yeah, everybody knows you don't have a speed advantage – but what you're going to do is make people earn it and then beat you in the red zone. And then that's where your big defensive players who are tougher have a bit of an edge. You see Northwestern do it that way. Stanford do it that way. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, maybe. I, I don't know if Kansas, I don't know if Les Miles would, would be able to bring in the kind of material. Basically, if he recruits kids and develops them on the offensive line and defensive line, they'll have a shot kind of no matter what scheme they play. If he doesn't, They'll have no shot. Yeah. Well, but I, I like the idea of a, of a coach saying, we're going to be tougher than you every week. If Les Miles is able to do that at Kansas, I think he'll have some success. Yeah. Well, I, I can assure you the offensive line culture at OSU, at, at KU is about to change because that's yeah. Les's that's his baby. background. That's and his baby. and uh, so I'm cool with the hire because I like Les and I enjoyed covering him at Oklahoma State. I'm just not sure. Um, oh, I, I just don't know him, what it's going to look like. If Nick Saban took the Kansas job, I wouldn't. Well, no, actually, with him, maybe I would. Uh, other than Nick Saban, there's nobody in college football you could put in that spot, and I'd say, yeah, they're going to be great in just two Les or three Les is going to make $2.8 million, which is b b quite a bit below what, the level I thought he would start there. Bill Self, of course, makes $3.8 so right. uh, it's a basketball see what school. what they're paying assistant coaches, who he's able to get. You yeah. know, I'm not sure what connections – um, you know, that's what's difficult by the time you are 65 years old as a head coach. All the guys that you came up with, they're scattered. They've mm -hmm. let it, you're having to start over kind of for a third or fourth time. That can be tricky, you know. Well, um, they need to give him – all right, I'll say this and we're done. Um, <laughs> well, if you decide we're done, we're done. But, but I mean, they, they, you know what, if they're going to invest in a less miles, entice him to come coach that program, then give him the money – uh, give him a million dollars your facility for, your, be great. for a coordinator. Uh, give him a million dollars for each of his coordinators and get quality people in there and then absolutely address those facilities yeah. and, and get them, get them, you know, you're not going to match what, they, what they've got in Stillwater and Norman overnight and may never ultimately ever, but you've got to get it beyond what it is. You, We're pulling for you, Les. It, it's got to look, it's, 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 it's you've got to make it for two years. you got to make it look like you're trying. And they haven't no. looked that, like no. they've been trying really since Mangino was out of there. All right. Well, we've been trying because that went for like 25 minutes. Not bad. So, Bill, not at all. I enjoyed it. Bill Haston, Cade McFarland. Hopefully, they haven't fallen asleep back in the control room. Uh, have a good one, everybody. We love you. Get out of here, you knuckleheads.